uh, it, today is October the 24th. This is the Fork River School Building Committee. Um, we are in the police station uh, community room, um, and this is being broadcast by Amherst Media. Um, and uh, so I will, I will call us to order. Um, and uh, we're going to, we may have, may be moving things around the agenda a little bit to, to make sure that we can get done what we can do while we have quorum. Um, the first item is approving uh, minutes from the previous meeting. If anyone had a comment or question on them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, attachments. So there was a new plan presented at the last meeting. Ah, they they, yeah, okay. so we need to get those on there. As okay. well as we talked, I had someone ask me specifically, so I think it's worthy because they you know, we talked about but didn't really ever talk about um, the notes that Maria sent to the architect. And it was, you know, that discussion didn't make it really into the minutes, nor did um, that posted the, the, e the email. They posted in the website. They posted them on the website. They are, right. the, all the documents that they sent us, they posted them on the website. Okay. The Okay, including including the, the yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I don't know if should they also be attached to the. But we never talked about them in the meeting, so I don't no, know. No, we didn't yeah. get to it. Yeah. Yeah. So they're. I think they're posted. Okay. They are in the documents from TSKP, uh, together with the other documents from last meeting. They're posted. There. Cool. Does that sound like it covers it then, or? refer to that. I mean, it's just kind of hanging out I there without a, like a reference or a footnote or any so way to get we, from point A to point B. And If there aren't any, if no one has any, what I propose is if no one has any changes to the minutes, then I'll recommend that we, or I'll say, let's, if someone would offer to approve them with the kind of caveat that they need to have that attached to them more formally, but that they're kind of approved as, as correct and not so corrected, but something like that. I have a question about organization because then we're going to have the documents in two places. We have one of one place in the website that we have all the documents produced by the SKP that are going by date, mm -hmm. and then uh, they're going to be repeated on the minutes. So, and those are more hidden because somebody might not know that they're in the minutes. So, uh, I like that they're posted both places, actually. Um, because if you're just trying to read through the minutes, if you don't, I don't know, it's... They all open on different pages, so it's... I'd, ra I'd rather hear on the side of more information than uh, see okay. if it's a little depleted, but I don't know. Marie, did you have a, or so did someone on the side of the table have yeah. a comment on the So um, the comment? page three at the top, um, we uh, talked about the library at Crocker Farm may be smaller, but it's not used for the same purposes, and I think that um, I recall chiming in and saying that it, there are public events there. The other thing is on page four near the bottom. Uh, it's just got the wrong date for the meeting. It was October 17, not 24, 2017. Yes, so it's page four, wrong date. So they, they need to be amended anyways, and so if they're amended, we can then append the corrected or the correct documents that went with them. Ooh, one more. Oh, one more. Sorry. Sorry. The paragraph before that, um, it says it, with uh, page four, bottom, uh, second paragraph in the bottom, uh, it says with the issued RQ, it should be RFQ, just so people know what we're talking about. Okay. I'm oh, taking too long to find it. There was a funny semi architectural term that was misused, but I don't, I'm not going to find it, and it's that important. <laughs> so it's not that we need to have them amended anyways. So okay, so we don't necessarily need to have a, a motion to approve them uh, until they get amended. Um, next item is public comments. We don't really have anything with anybody from the com uh, from the public today, in, live and in person. Um, I'm going to move uh, invoices up since that requires a vote. Um, I think everyone should have one in front of them. This is for last the, the last meeting, which is the seventeenth. Yes. Oh, that well, that date correctly was the talking about the school committee. That, oh, uh, okay. That was October seventeenth, twenty seventeen. Okay. Twenty seventeen. Yeah. Oh, not that's the date right. That's meeting. right. That yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I got to write that down because I, I go back and do that. And it would have been what fourteenth? The tenth. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah.
Mark was our last one. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on the on the uh, invoice. We'd entertain a, a motion to approve it. Where? Move to approve uh, the invoice dated 10 10 2018 for Laura Bishop in the amount of $262.50. Second. All in favor? Great. Um, Maybe we could talk briefly about the, uh, the status of the survey and the geotech. I talked a little bit with you today, but I'll let you do the talk. And so uh, the survey, spoke with Berkshire Design today. They, uh, he says that they are about halfway done. Um, and we haven't had great follow-up with them. There's some, some confusion of who was actually in charge. But we'll probably talk to them more often now and make sure they're, they're on schedule. But, uh, they say that's fine. I don't know if we need to have the architects talk to them at this stage, or if they're just, they're just, they're just interested in the output. I mean, I think you, you all would be interested in the output. I don't know if you like any interaction with the, with the surveyor. Uh, I mean, uh, what we typically see from them is uh, sort of a progress print or something, um, which we would review to see if there's any omissions that, that concern us. Okay. Um, so at a point where they feel like they've got something substantive, we would look at it just before they complete all their work. Okay. And presumably, uh, halfway done is really referring to the in the office time. They, they presumably have finished their field work a, a while ago. Uh, I got the impression that they had not fully finished oh, their okay. field work, actually. Okay. I, know the, I know the wetlands have been flagged. I don't uh, know. OK, so maybe they haven't been back out to record digitally where those flags are. Yeah, and the, I'm, this is where I'm at a little bit of a Disadvantage because I don't necessarily know the technical parts here. But right. Yeah. Okay. I don't know exactly what to ask. But. I would it be? I mean, I I, I wouldn't know what to ask. <laughs> I don't want to put uh, something else on here. Yeah. Okay, 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 uh, okay. But if if you if if you feel like you need clarity, you can, you can feel free to, to to bug me. All right. Uh, and the geotech was out for uh, yeah quotes are that yeah, quotes are due tomorrow afternoon. Um, since it's a straightforward quote process, I'll proceed directly to making up a contract, and I'll keep you guys informed. But I don't think it really makes sense to review or approve it. It's a I have to award the low bidder that meets all the qualifications. Okay. So there were uh, numer there were qu quite a few questions. Jim McPherson was able to answer them. Um, uh, Jesse at TSKP did offer some input on the specs, so that's where we are. Okay. So is that um, those communications that right, is that going to get sent to the whole committee or those communications? Yeah. What like the, the questions? Yeah. Oh uh, no, because most of them were you can find the answer in this section. But uh, if if someone's curious about them, I can share them. Yeah. It was, it, it didn't substantively change the. No, we did. Request. No, there was a formatting error that I had to fix, but nothing of substance. Got it. Thanks. Um, do a little time check. Uh, what else can we move forward here? It's rant, rant, well, Jesse has all the drawings. Not all. Okay. Um, well, what would make sense from your perspective to, to, to start at this point? In yeah, so there, there are, I mean, he, he, Jesse is, is the most intimately familiar with the, the weeds uh, of what's going on. But there are, there are some things that, uh, that we can probably productively discuss. So is Jesse on his way? He's yes. on his way. Okay. He's coming from Southern Connecticut and, and he got hung up in an accident somewhere. Oh, man. So uh, this is uh, sort of a follow-up to uh, the conversations you had, I believe, at the last meeting, um, discussing uh, mechanical options in the context of sustainability and energy efficiency and those, those kinds of things. Uh, since that time, two things have happened. Uh, one, um, we had a conversation with uh, Jim Person. Um, he had seen the minutes and, and or watched the video, I guess, and, and wanted to comment on, on some of the systems um, that were being entertained. Uh, and then also our, uh, our consultants kind of went through and created this sort of matrix to help 
kind of understand some of the pluses and minuses of the various systems. So, um, uh, starting with uh, Jim's comments, uh, he is particularly concerned with any system that uh, requires uh, maintenance within teaching spaces. Uh, he said it's just a colossal problem uh, with the current unit events and things like that to get you know, the, the, the hours that the people, the service people are available to work coincide with the hours that the staff are teaching. It's very disruptive. The staff are not receptive to having workmen in their space. Perfectly understandable. Uh, and so he, as far as he's concerned, those kinds of systems are not acceptable in his, in his, from his perspective. So um, if you flip over to, to the back, what I would call the, the back, you'll see uh, the three systems at the top, which are kind of blued out. Uh, and those systems are the VRF systems. Uh, because, again, just as a reminder, the VRF system is a distributed system with basically in each room there's a separate um, I don't know, cassette, let's call it, that, that provides the heating and the cooling. So it'll have a fan, it'll have a filter. Um, both of which have uh, you know, temperature controls, uh, all of which will require maintenance from time to time. Uh, and this system, whether it's actually visible in the ceiling or above the ceiling, uh, is in each classroom, each space that requires heating, cooling, gets one of these units. So it is sort of the ultimate in terms of distribution and, and in terms of maintenance, it, it would require people to either work you know, on, on or after hours or weekends or, or be in there when the staff and the space is being used. So, um, so we are, are suggesting that those three systems um, not be pursued, if, if you guys uh, agree. Uh, it seems like it's an exercise that probably isn't, you know, we can cost it, but if it's a non-starter from from Jim's point of view, um, then uh, it seems like an exercise that's probably not worth doing, uh, as it'll probably just confuse the picture. Um, I, I will say, though, that option one, um, the air-cooled VRF, is one of the least expensive options. Uh, so if, if that, you know, maybe that would dissuade you from ruling it out. Um, now, we did add one option, and that would be this option six, uh, which is just a VAV system, which is the sort of the most traditional system that's been around since you know some people were blowing air in buildings. Um, it's it's kind of bulletproof, uh, and and Jim kind of likes this system from his perspective, uh, and for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, the first is uh, maintenance is centralized. There'll be a, a rooftop units that will serve particular areas. The maintenance all occurs on the rooftop in the units. Um, in the rooms themselves, there might be a, a distribution box, which is basically just a damper, um, but which typically has little or no maintenance. The filters are all up in the rooftop unit. Uh, the other thing he really likes about that system versus these other systems is that it just moves air around. Uh, and his concern with any of the other systems, whether it be VRF uh, or the water-cooled systems, is that you're, you're moving either refrigerant or water around in pipes, which, depending on your perspective, is good or bad. His perspective is bad because he doesn't have the people who can fix leaks in pipes. He said, so it'll be great the first five, six, seven, eight years, and then, you know, I'm going to start getting leaks here and there. And I don't have the people that, you know, water comes in, it stains ceiling tiles. If they don't deal with it right away, we get mold. You know, we're off and running, and it's a whole big problem from his perspective. Um, the, the advantage to air is, again, there are no leaks other than air leaks. The efficiency may go down, but you, you won't have that kind of a maintenance issue, which currently he's concerned about. The, uh, the downside to the VAV, one of the reasons it was sort of dismissed uh, initially, is in, 
and in a renovation option, or in an op any option that involves some portion of renovation, you are achieving all your heating, cooling, and ventilation with ducts, which means the ducts get quite large. And as we all know, the existing building has extremely limited height between the steel and the floor. So the ability to run ductwork through the building is an extreme challenge. So it was sort of dismissed as not really terribly viable. Now we kind of rethought that given Jim's concerns and his preferences. Uh, and so there are ways to work around that, one of which is basically to create <coughs> dog houses or pen houses on the roof that the ductwork would run around up above. So we would kind of enclose it in a whole other little structure up there. Um, and so that would allow us to get it around the building. So one of the things you're going to see as you look at initial cost, this option 6 to VAV, uh, its initial cost just for the duct work and is the least expensive. But we put a plus because a couple things happen. One, the initial cost that is indicated here is just the mechanical system. So the cost of these dog houses and the roofing associated and any structural modifications necessary to support the rooftop units is not built into that number. And these other systems would not have comparable architectural costs. So that's going to affect the first costs. The other piece is that it is the least um, efficient. So if you look in operation, uh, the operational cost, uh, one is good in that category. Six is, is, the, is bad. You see it's the least um, efficient, efficient in terms of operational cost. Uh, and since in the options where we have additions, uh, we have to get to net zero for, for the additional square footage. So the less efficient the system is, the more PV you say we need to buy. That's also not calculated into that first cost. So there's going to be some additional costs, which a pricing exercise will help us understand what that means. Um, so what we're suggesting uh, maybe going forward um, is that maybe we do not pursue the VRF option. Uh, we pursue the, the water-cooled uh, options and add this VAV option as, a, as another alternative uh, and see where those costs kind of flush out. And so the range of these options would be explored in the range <coughs> of the costs in the initial kind of pass that the cost estimate would take. Yeah, we would sort of apply these to each of the options and, and their cost. For example, the, the VAV cost in a new building will be the least expensive because we have the ability to accommodate the ducts in the new construction so we don't do any extraordinary measures. So there, you know, it will be the most cost effective. Uh, but in the various renovation options, it'll have a larger, more incremental cost. cost. Well, well, you will theoretically still have that, that question mark about the, the amount of PV that you're yes. to offset it. Yes. So that could still be a it, it'll, plus. It, exactly. It'll yeah. still be something, but we don't know how much that is yet. I have a question that I think probably we have to ask Jim. For example, the option one, mm -hmm. um, that initial cost is low, the operational cost is lower than the option six. Uh, maintenance, because on the four and five, Jim is concerned about water. That down the line, five or six years, him we may need maintenance with water. The maintenance on these ones is it yearly that you have to be doing changing filters and doing repairs, or is it a five or six five year maintenance? For example, in the option one, the type of maintenance because he's concerned about getting somebody sure. in. Is it that you have to go every year in? that potentially you could do some preventive work during the summer, change all the filters when the students are not there? Or is it every three, four, five years, so then it starts becoming? Yeah, no, it's uh, the, the biggest kind of routine maintenance would be filter changes, and those should probably ideally should occur twice a year. Um, now, uh, if, if they're regularly scheduled and regularly performed, typically we see districts, they'll do them over, say, Christmas break, and they'll do them over the summer. And those are their two big times. Um, so it, in that case, you know, it wouldn't be terribly disruptive, assuming you can get that scheduled properly. The, the other maintenance uh, with, say, the VRF systems uh, is, is more um, just uh, repairs to the system. And so, so one of the issues when you have a distributed system is you'll have one or two of these 
units in every single room uh, in the building. So you might have you know 150 of these in your school. Well, even if only 2% of them break down, that means on any given time, I'm gonna have maybe you know, two or three units that, that need work, need service. So there, you know, so there could always be somebody kind of some room somewhere fixing one of these things. Probably not on day one, oh, but exactly. we're, we're trying to project a building that's gonna be there for right. 25 so, to 50 years. So, you know, and you know, after the first couple of years, you're gonna start having those kinds of things occur on a fairly routine basis. They're easy fixes, they're not a big deal, uh, but they're gonna just be kind of this kind of ongoing uh, issue, which again, I don't think from a cost pers perspective in terms of the maintenance cost is, is a big factor, but there is a certain <coughs> disruption that occurs with that, that that you need to be aware of, I guess. So the maintenance category is um Maintenance cost. This this sort of rubric doesn't take enough into account sort of <coughs> disruption. disruption. Yeah. Yeah. Co correct. Yeah, it's, it's not really the disruption piece. Maria, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so, can you tell me what uh, other projects have done, other school projects have done, and do they find um, particularly option one, you know, air cooled cool, cool VRF? Will you you're not you're not going to put refrigerant in the rooms, you're not going to be piping water. Um, it's just, my understanding is that this would be much like mini splits that the residential folks would be familiar with. Um, well, or is there still a, a yeah. chapter of warm water component to this? Yeah, there, I mean, I believe with any of the VRF systems, you are, you're going to have be piping refrigerant around, and there'll be, there'll be small little uh, condensers on the roof. Okay. Very small, um, and and that that's going to be inherent, I think, in, in any of these. Okay. VRFs. So, but going back, what um, can you what what have other schools done, and what is what's been their experience <coughs> with them? Sure. Uh, well, we we typically do VRF in in renovations, uh, precisely because of its uh, limited footprint or limited requirements for space. Uh, like I said, the, the, the units that, uh, the condensers uh, uh, that go on the roof, very small, they're basically residential size like you have at your own home for refrigeration if you have central uh, air conditioning. So the weight's not a problem, they're not very visible, so they're, that's easy to accommodate. Refrigeration piping is tiny, um, and they're quite efficient. Uh, and, and the first costs are, are quite manageable. So they're not at all uncommon in, in renovation projects because they solve a lot of the problems that you just can't get around in some renovation projects. Um, now, in terms of the maintenance, I, I've only, we've only been doing VRF, I wanna say, for the past, in our office, maybe five to seven years. I think the first one we did was actually quite a large one. Uh, it was uh, in Bloomfield, Connecticut, Bloomfield High School. So it's a huge project, but it was a 1960s building with a uh, 10 foot floor to floor, a two story, uh, and it had no ceilings. It was exposed yeah. structure, you know, the what was all the rage then. So there was just no ability to run anything through there. So it, it, it worked. And I did go back and talk to their uh, facilities director uh, a couple of years ago uh, when we were getting ready to use it on another project, uh, and, and he was quite satisfied. He, he, but it's a big district. They have staff who are quite capable of, of kind of taking care of these minor nuisance problems. And so they just were rolling with it. And, and, and it's they, a high school, so it's, there's probably periods where the rooms are unoccupied. Oh, absolutely. Which is a little, you know, yeah, exactly. elementary school level. It's a bit, little bit more of a challenge. Exactly, you're absolutely right. You know, typical occupancy rate in a, in a high school is, you know, maybe 80% of the time that the room's occupied. Typically, every room is <coughs> unoccupied at least one or two periods a day. Right? So, so you do have the ability to move people around uh, if you have a room that's not working or they can schedule it and get in there when that room is, is empty. So that's the only, only one where I've gone back and talked fast how it was working. And that's one that had been in service for about four years when I talked to them. Um, 
we have done them, I've done it probably about four other times uh, since then, all similar kind of situations. Um, but I have not had an opportunity or I haven't got any feedback. I haven't heard any complaints, so, so that's somewhat positive, but I haven't actively gone back and said, so how's it working? What are the issues that you've been experiencing? Um, well, I just, I just wanted to say that, I mean, if I'm looking at this chart and I'm looking at the operational costs, and I know that we're going for a net zero building, it, it seems to me as though the options that we should be considering are the ones that have the lowest operational costs, and that the first cost, while important, it's, we're going to be paying for it one way or the other, either up front or along the years, so I don't, I just, I'm okay moving on from talking about the, the VRFs personally, you know, I don't know if we have, you know, how we can move the conversation right. along, but it just doesn't seem like it's really worthwhile if the, you know, the person who's in charge of maintenance is not interested in them and they've got a high operational cost. Relative, relatively high. Relatively, yeah. Yeah, 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 higher than the other, some of the other options that are, that are there. Yeah, um, except for number six. I guess the way I, I I'd ask a, a similar but slightly different question. If we remain with just these three, are we covering enough range in the options we're pricing to say that that you know we looked at a spectrum of mechanical systems that would give us the opportunity to choose between things that are either have lower first costs or things that are going to be easier to be you know, more net zero? Um, are we? Are, is there a piece here that we won't get if we if we exclude it, um, knowing that ultimately? It's a feasibility study. Right. Technology changes. Um, there might be, a, you know, might, there will be a different perspective potentially down the line. I just want to make sure that that we're not precluding something that's going to give us a skewed vision, sure. I guess, of, of what what the range is. So, so I think the only thing you are are not going <coughs> to capture in terms of bracketing the different parameters is is sort of. Uh, uh, a low cost, a really kind of low cost option for uh, renovation, which I low think is low first cost. Yes, yes, low first cost. Okay. And and there's you know there's always some. You know, there's no community that spends this kind of money that someone isn't asking is there a cheaper way to do it. So um, so you you will not have that option uh, priced Be because of the kind of. Pluses that come with the 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 option six, the VAV approach. Yes, exactly. Um, now it, it could it could be that uh, that they end up being very similar, and you, so you may. Yeah. But if we leave it out, we don't really. No, right. we don't necessarily. I mean, would you have been asking us to pare down the list of five if Jim hadn't kind of suggested a pre-pairing or? Or would you have taken all five to, to the cost estimator? Um, a little context. Sure. Uh, we probably would have uh, gone with just the five that we had. We probably would not have been looking at the VAB system, um, w which, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, we're doing less and less of that just because the energy codes are getting more and more demanding right. uh, and operational costs are uh, a huge issue in every district. I mean, it's always a a big of contention every year is there's budget, so you want to drive those down. But but I also will say uh, that frequently the facilities directors that we deal with um, maybe are not as uh, proactive in thinking about what are these systems going to be like 10 years out, 15 years out, and do I have the staff, and how do I, um, which, you know, to Jim's credit, he's, he's thinking that way, which is, right. Great, because that's his job. <laughs> um, Mike? Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no. Okay, yeah, so I mean, my inclination, I'm not a voting member, but I just want to put out that maintaining option one just gives us perhaps a more realistic cost estimate for renovation because of all the things you just said. Not, And there's some downsides to that, and I think we just have to be really clear about those downsides, but I think if the point of this exercise is to gather as much information as we can, it's not that I love, I mean, I, Jim has talked to me, but I understand his point of view, and I don't necessarily disagree with the meta level of his concerns, but I feel like 
to not gather that information doesn't feel quite right to me, right. given Especially what we're doing. So I mean, I'm, I'd be inclined if it was, and it's clearly not up to me, but if it was up to me, just include that and be really clear as it's being presented, sure. this system's efficient and right. it might involve some maintenance and challenges. I don't think, I think that's all good information to have. And this is around gathering about information with the community. I think we'd be a little remiss not to have that. Sure. So um, I guess in contrast to what Mike was just saying, since I am a voting member, <laughs> yes. as you're, you're banging that drum, uh, I, I, I agree with what you just said. Um, I think we should, I mean, even with exactly what you just said and exactly what you said too, we're going to see the downsides down the road as we're looking at these. That's actually part of the point of the exercise, is to see what the different trade-offs are of different choices and what the costs are associated with them. and you know, be able to get good information that we can use. So um, I would, I don't think we need to move this as a motion, but since I also think we should probably move on to other topics, mm -hmm. my recommendation would be we include one, four, five, and six, drop the air, the water-cooled one simply because um, I really do agree with Jim's idea that having water flowing through pipes all out throughout the building sounds like something everyone's going to regret in 35 years. Um, and then just move on. <coughs> so I just want to um, ask if it's possible, you're talking about initial cost and operational cost, and I think it's helpful for people to understand, you know, at what point do you make up that difference, right? When, when people are deciding whether to put PV on their roof, they're just like, okay, I'm going to pay this much, and that, but, but I know in five years I'll be okay. Is that kind of analysis going to be possible? Will you be able to, to weigh in on that aspect and say, I know if you drop a geothermal well, it's big, but this is how long it will take. Yeah, I had the same I mean? question with the, you had an energy engineer here last week. Will he be doing those, that analysis? Yeah, uh, I don't think you could, you could really kind of go forward ultimately with a recommended system. <laughs> Uh, without some kind of analysis on payback, mm -hmm. you know, and that will be very telling. I mean, some system, you know, some systems may be very efficient, but the first cost is such that the payback is just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Fifty years from now, mm -hmm. right? That's probably yeah. an exaggeration. And yeah. so, yeah. so the life of the equipment, right? So we can do that, um, and and the first step is is we we do need to kind of get some first costs. And I would say that. Um, it's really, I think it's important that whatever that infer what, what what that shows the return on investment or mm -hmm. the payback and all that that that's put forward as to elevated to as high level as our first costs are because I think usually when people are looking at these projects we're going to be looking at the price tag of the building and I and I, I don't want that to be hidden in any way sure um, so no, I think I it'd be really important to just put it right up there mm -hmm. And you know when you're presenting the information, P particularly now since part of the point of the exercise is to actually establish the budget. Mm -hmm. Frequently, when at least in Connecticut, when we come on board, the budget's already locked in. So I just had this kind of we just had a similar charrette on sustainability on another project where the budget set and it was about sustainability, and they were all excited about you know let's do geothermal. I said it's a wonderful thing, but the budget won't support it. I said, but it, it'll pay for itself and. You know, ten years, and we got the building for this. That, that makes great sense. The the budget won't support it, and the numbers are locked in. Here, since you're, you know, you can do the analysis up front, and sure. if it makes sense, Bigger then you can sure. put it yeah. in the budget, and everyone understand why you're paying a little bit more in a mechanical system because it'll pay for itself in eight years, and it's all gravy. And people, oh, okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be helpful, and we'll do yeah. that. Thanks. Do we have more? Or I guess there's two questions. One is, do you, I, I kind of hear a consensus about yep. where to go with this. And I just want to make sure you felt like you had some uh, direction and make sure that I'm actually hearing consensus and that any other anybody else who had a contrary view about at least keeping number one up here. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like options two and three. We'll like, consensus we'll go, is go, that, yeah. at least for now, we can drop those and we'll just go with one, four, five, and six. That gives you a good bracket of costs options, efficiencies, and then we'll go from there. Okay. I'll quickly check the time. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's 5, 35. Um, I think it would be probably great to move then right on to 
Jesse and <laughs> yeah, perfect uh, time. <laughs> not give him much time to breathe and to relax. All right. Um, I have a couple handouts. Maybe if we start at this end with this one. Can I help you with the justice? You don't have to. No, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, you were helping. If you just pass that one around. Right. Take one at a time. Are these identical to what we received? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's just okay. 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 Alright. Um, before we dive into the options, um, there's a couple things that happened since our last meeting that I'd like to give you an update on. Um, we had a meeting with the special education um, district staff, as well as a representative from CPAC, the Special <coughs> Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, and uh, it, it was constructive. We um, refined our understanding of the, your program needs for, for those spaces. Uh, and we revised, revised the room list. Uh, right, the room list, re reflecting that. And the overall square footage of the building really didn't change. Um, we had increased spaces in some areas and we have decreased in others um, and so it's um, that's kind of the overall um, and so then we worked with that refined understanding and we revised the options um, which we can go through tonight there's, there's a lot here on the building layouts and options um, but I think um, our goal tonight or our question to you is our, our next step would be to go has this been discussed? No. Uh, would be to go forward to our cost estimator with these options. Um, and we're looking for your agreement in that, that it's, it's time to get that kind of information into this analysis. So I've, I would <coughs> focus you on actually the first page, which is this um, matrix, um, which shows options A through F across the top. Um, and then it shows you that we actually have some options within each major option. So that while A through F is of course six options, we actually have 11 options that we would price. Uh, and the reason we structured it that way is to kind of get at some of the things that are on the table and maybe they're not officially on the table. Um, we have a sense that we're, we're finding our way um, with regard to some of these decisions. And would it make sense, I suppose, to get cost information that would support either path so that you don't have to commit um, tonight to saying where we are? So let's go through um, how this breaks down. I've arranged the options so that option A is now the new, new construction option. So you can see in the first um, column under A, it's 100% new construction, which also means it's 100% net zero, the way that uh, the town regulation works regarding net zero. Um, and then all the way down to F, there's zero new construction. So there's a whole spectrum in these options where A is 100%, B is 50% new construction, C happened to be right around 30%, 29%, and then it, it becomes less um, through D and E. Um, and then the first sub-option you, you come across is there's an A.1. A.1 and B.1 and C.1. All the point ones have to do with they're identical to A, um, except we've removed the pre-K program uh, so that we could get a number as to see how that would affect the overall project budget. I realize our mandate is to include the pre-K program, but I'm suggesting that it would be possible to estimate it that way. Yes? So if, uh, are you, I'm, I'm trying to think forward now. If you have these options now, is it your assumption that at the end of this project we still have information for all these options, or is at some point do they get down selected from the, from there? Well, um, we could carry these options through the end, um, and we could also down select if, if 
Yeah. Well, the, re the reason I'm asking is that um, assuming there's both information, like both straightforward information, I guess for one of my way of phrasing it, as well as all, like data points and things like that, as well as also some kind of analysis like you describe construction phasing. And so presumably there'd be some sort of narrative description of what that would look like for the different options. Um, similarly, we were talking about a moment ago about net zero and about the energy efficiency of different building options. Presumably, that would be carried forward and described in different ways for these different options. The reason I'm, I mean, and, I, and I'll go back to your point ones, um, since the, the charge was to, to include pre-K, but also it's not there are decisions beyond this group as to whether or not we'd end up with pre-K. Sure. I actually think having um, options that both include it and don't include it is actually, if we can do that, right. why wouldn't we want to do that? Because then it gives the town more information about different options. Right. That just sounds like a good thing. Yeah, so to your question about our narratives, we are in the process of developing narratives for um, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, and those will address net zero. Uh, we will also need to give the estimator a narrative on construction phasing, um, so for each option. Right. So that's currently our, our plan. I think um, our thinking about the point ones is that we're mostly focused on the, the option that includes pre-K. but. It's possible within these options, you can see how pre-K can be removed. As it happens, it doesn't affect the sizing of spaces in the K through five, K through six program. So you can think of it as pulled away and that the rest of the program remains intact. Um, so yes, we, we can get cost information removing pre-K, I, I think. Um, without having to create a whole new set of studies. Yeah. By the way, I wasn't. I'm not. I know. My understanding is there was. There's been some debate. I think there's been some debate about whether or not option F is something people want to carry forward. I'm not. I'm not actually debating the question of whether we want to move forward with every single option. I'm just saying. I was trying to get an understanding, which I have now, of whether we were there was going to be some sort of forced exercise in the future, where you're going to say no, you can only have four tell me which four you want. And if the general answer is that, at the very least, for example, we could have eight, then um, I would say awesome. So I got two, uh, what's the first? <laughs> Mike? I can leave in two minutes of, oh, if it's okay. So, um, and I can follow up with the committee or with you all and just a couple pieces of feedback. So first, I really appreciate the change in where the specialized program space is located. So I just want to acknowledge that you know, it's an outcome of some of that feedback. In, in places that make um, more sense for our programming. So I just want Great. to thank you for that. Um, just a couple quick things. I know these are MSBA guidelines, but on cafeteria dining, it, it was two serving, two servings or settings. Uh, we typically do three. It could have implications for size, you know, depending on the way you look at it, but, you know, about downsizing a little bit, if that makes sense, because we have fewer. We've been, I've been through this before, so, you know, um, that yeah. part of it. Um, I also wanted to raise that um, one thing I hadn't thought of until Monday night school committee meeting was about ELL classrooms. So right now, the ELL space is pretty, pretty reduced from the current setting. And if this this is sort of 420 hinges on school committee voting forward, um, a plan around making a dual language program, which actually will have a significant increase in English learner population at the school. So it's just something to think about. I don't think it's a huge deal right now for me, um, but it's just, some of the implications of the school getting larger, but actually the specialized programs, and that's, I don't want to, some of the programs within the school will actually have to adjust because the demographics of the school will change along with that. And I was literally at the meeting Monday night thinking through. Right. Mike, can you do me a favor, or proxy to the committee a favor? Can you translate that again into what you're talking about in terms of space? Sure. You're saying there's certain rooms that we don't have programmed here that we might need if we're sure. that? So I'm looking at the space summary. I'm going to use the big one, not the one that you on. Um, so in special education, although it's not special education, that's the way that MSBA codes it, um, ELL classrooms, so currently there's 1,400 square feet at Fort River, 1,100 square feet at Chakra Farm for ELL classrooms, yep. and in this setting, there's 
350 times 2 to so 700 feet yeah. for ELL spaces, and the population of the school may become such that we actually need to increase the spaces for ELL students because the population, not just the general population of the school, but actually the percent of the school that are English language learners is likely to go up if this program goes forward. Um, it's not wildly, you know, so I don't know the level of granular details. The conversation that Maria raised last time a good one, like what's the right grain size of detail that would be helpful for you, but um, that's just something that kind of I didn't notice until I really thought through the implication we're going through what the enrollment would be of, of such a program. So um, I do have to run, I apologize, but it's something that certainly anyone can follow up with me on the committee or the architects. Can I, can I ask you one, just one yeah. really quick question before you disappear? I mean, do you feel like you've had enough time with this to pick out those sort of things? Um, so I had a couple other pieces of feedback that, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm conscious I missed uh, a number of meetings, um, but that's the one, because there's a lot of moving pieces with the dual language program, I hadn't thought of, I was thinking of the 420 implication and not necessarily, well, actually, the, there's going to be a functional change in right. the demographics of the students attending the school. So I hadn't thought through that element until we were kind of combining, talking about the dual language and then talking about the feasibility. Okay. Well, so, um, sorry, I have a comment about the dual language yeah. program. How do other schools do it? Because my understanding from doing the research for the dual language is that the purpose of the dual language is that it's much better, but it's beneficial for the English language learners, and they don't need so much support because it's taken care of by the dual language program. So I want to know how other districts that have dual yeah. language and what is the implication of that? Because my understanding is it's the other way around. We don't need so much specialized teaching because it takes care within the classroom for the biggest thing. It's pushed in. It's pushed right. in within the classroom and not outside. So a couple of things. One is that we have Spanish-speaking ELL students comprise about 48% of our ELL population. So with the school getting 100 students larger than it currently is, just by default, it's going to be, there's going to be more ELL students because the school's going to be larger. And I think in terms of the second point you raised, I think you're right that there's more opportunities for inclusion services for English language learners, they still are state required to have ELL services. And based on the range of factors, some of that's going to be in the room and some of that's going to be out of the room. And that was true in Cambridge when I visited their school, which is in Massachusetts, as well as in Virginia. Dan, I don't know if you saw when, when you were in Holyoke, I know their ELL population actually is lower than ours at the school you visited. Um, and I read it visited as well. Their, their ELL population is 10% and ours is district-wide is 16%. So it just, I, I, again, these aren't sure. huge, like, wow, you have to multiplied by 10, but it's no. just something that I was thinking about as I thought about the school getting larger and the population. For, for perspective, that addition, let's say we doubled the ELL yeah. rooms, we'd have an additional 700 square feet. But then you mentioned the cafeteria could perhaps be three ways. That could take back the 700 square feet right there. Right. So it's kind of like we're refining and refining this document, um, and we may be moving beyond our study in terms of the refinement. Absolutely, and that's why I didn't want to, I'm sorry to speak in a term because I have to walk out, but that's why I didn't want to, I don't know the grain size that's helpful at this point, and I thought I'd offer it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, I'm sorry. So I just want to bring something up because um, we <coughs> talked about this at our last meeting, and a lot of us know what's gone on between then, but the people that are watching um, and that are following along don't know that we um, have resolution on about the pre-K and whether that was within scope of this committee, and it is. Um, so that has been completely clarified that okay. our committee is tasked with a pre-K through six school. That's it. Just kind of for the record. For the, yeah, well, other, uh, I mean, it, people don't know what's been going on. Right. So. Yeah, I heard a comment to follow up on the I was looking at the one book space summary because I think Whitewood is more, much similar than Crocker Farm in terms of population and space. And I cannot find an ELI room on the space description of Whitewood. Uh, this was used for the previous project. I was looking there. There is nothing in there. Um, if you look at the spaces summaries of Whitewood, um, are very different from Crocker Farm and very completely different from uh, Fort River. And the target population right now, I think they have 430 students right now. Um, yeah, so it's, they have 430 students right now uh, in the same footprint as Fort River. Uh, they still have a specialized, specialized, special education programs in there. They only have one of them. 
but um, if we look at sizes uh, and rooms, I think we have to find that balance because we have this the example of Whitewood that they have. I, I'm looking at this place in Maryland, they don't have any. Um, and then we are talking about having five. So um, for the same number, for the same population. So, so I think we have to find a balance and not just look at, I think Croker Farm is great, but also I think we should be looking at. Well, I, I, I think we could have, or we need to probably have a, a in-depth conversation about the program yeah. to some degree. I also want to make sure that given our limited time, yeah. we're also addressing the, the things that you want us to address. So I don't necessarily want to cut off conversation, but I, I'm feeling that at some point we're going to try to lose form. Mm -hmm. We want to keep us as focused as we can. Yeah, you got to move forward. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to mention, I know that I mentioned this before, I don't know how much we should be nitpicking this, honestly, because we're not the building committee or a feasibility study, so I don't know how much detail we should actually go into nitpicking that, because I am really concerned about this therapeutic space that I mentioned before that's kind of a, a level one, tier one intervention for all of our students to access that's not included in the Building Box or Ames program, and that's it's a highly... Yeah. Is that hard? Oh. Uh, there's another one. Great, there. fantastic, I'm gonna pick that up. So the only other thing I wanna mention is I, I have concerns, and I'll speak, I don't wanna speak for Mike, but I know that that pre-K question is a big question because if we're gonna develop a pre-K program, that means a significant increase in appropriation of budget. So I don't know if we can pull that off. But maybe we can, maybe we can't, but it's a, it's a, there's a cost factor not only in the building, but in staffing that pre-K program. I just think on that, I mean, this is something that I wasn't, at the last meeting, um, and um, maybe maybe I missed it every meeting. I have no idea if I missed one, but I know I would have been sorely missed at the last meeting because I remembered the school committee's vote and I remembered the debate and the fact we made that decision. And um, it, this is one of those challenges. I mean, what we cut God knows how much money out of the half million dollars out of the elementary budget this past um, spring, million dollars out of the regional budget. Um, we know we don't have the money right now for preschool at all. We don't have enough money to fund everything we want to fund as it is, and we know that. Um, the question ends up being, particularly for feasibility, this is why I made the comment earlier that, that my bias is I would, I would love it if we could have both preschool included and also a model where it's not included. Um, because just giving the committee, giving the town, giving <coughs> everyone, all of our neighbors, more information about um, what our options are, I think is healthy to do. And you know, if we're, if we're ever gonna get there, knowing mm -hmm. what it would look like to include preschool mm -hmm. is something that I think is just useful information. I think it's, it's right for you or the superintendent or anyone else, including the school committee and others, to mention that we just simply don't have the money to do it right now, and so we don't have any idea how we'd fund it if we built it. But um, getting the information to figure out what it would look like, I think, is. Agree. I mean, that's why the that's why the committee did the that's why the school committee did the vote we did a year ago is because we said this is really this is a feasibility committee to get up information and options to build stronger information based and consensus throughout the town. I mean, you said this a few couple months ago, uh, Maria, that the entire point is not actually to delimit options in ways that make it seem like we're making choices and decisions that then have lots of radical implications for people down the road who are looking at this information. Ideally, it's a platform for building consensus around what, what, what's viable, what's possible, and what's good information around doing it. And so it's good to, so that, I mean, that's why the committee did its vote. But that's also why, as I said, I love the idea of getting it with and without so that we have that information. Sorry, that's a, almost a little, so look, I don't want to call it. I think she's leaving and we're going to lose four of my things. Well, very soon. Very soon. Like school, We've got sorry. eight right now. <laughs> we're going to be down to seven. seven. So, okay, so we can. I'll I have hold on to Allison. <laughs> 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 we can <laughs> change this. Well, what's the time check on that? Though? Seriously. So, what so do we have? The, there is a, there's a program happening at the school. Yes. No, I'm going to Allison's going to be leaving for two in about 20 minutes. I should be leaving now, but I'm going to. I'll wait. Until, uh, like she, she's going to burn a little goodwill with other yeah, volunteers. <laughs> and my family. <laughs> and your family. <laughs> so soon now we need to really ask, right, what, right. what, do, you I, need, I, what do you need from us? 
I mean, I think we're going to have to come back to some of these other things, and they deserve right. a full conversation. We're just running out of time tonight, so I want to make sure we can do as much as we can, Jesse. And so I'm not going to turn the floor back over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd like to know that you're okay with us estimating these options. If that requires a vote, I guess that's up for you to decide. But that would be our next step. Okay. You're not proceeding there. I'm not sure what else you need. So to do. I would want to ask a little follow up to that. So we know that we're still looking at, at this program. And there's things, and it gets back to that whole how fine a detail do we need to be in for a feasibility study. Um, but it also gets to, we gotta stand up and talk in front of the public <laughs> yes. about this and, and having a certain comfort level with it. Mm -hmm. And so if we have to adjust some of these things, um, obviously we're not gonna try to do that. You know, we, we don't come back a day later and say, okay, tell the cost estimator to change this immediately. I mean, we wanna make sure we do this rationally, but I'd also like to know that there's some ability to, to make some adjustments to this um, if as a body we feel we need to um, and it doesn't make the cost estimated the cost estimation process less useful or less efficient or, or you know sure. produce a result that's not valuable to us well we need to hold it still for the next two weeks right. while this estimating happens but we have a chance to go back another estimating check we have okay. planned so if there's if there's a variation on the options, if you know we realized, oh, we really wanted the small gym in every option, for example, then we, I think we could accommodate those kinds of changes. What do you think? No, I, I, I agree. And, and the other thing is, it, it does seem like um, we're drilling down now so that, you know, the, the most recent change, so maybe it's 700 square feet of, you know, that's less than 1%. Yeah. of the building we're talking about. And, and that's less than the margin of error in an estimate. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's good to keep drilling down on these things because somebody will stand up who happens to have a child in the program and want to know exactly how many, and, and you have to be able to answer that with some kind of confidence so you have credibility. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the estimate and the, you know, basically the orders of magnitude that we're going to be getting, uh, right now it feels like we're, we're, we're fine. I mean, these little adjustments are not going to alter uh, in any substantive way, I think, the numbers that we're going to generate. And then we do have the opportunity, as Jesse said, to come back and, and you know, say, oh, we, we like what we do, but we're going to make a little change to that gym, and this one we decided we want to do it. We'll make those final adjustments, and then and then you'll have something that I think is pretty accurate for what you need. Options, questions? So um, I <coughs> think we're close. But I think there are a number of spaces um, that that could make a big difference. And when we're talking about cost estimation, if, let's say you know a thousand square feet, that's about you know if you take a kind of an average ballpark, you figure that's you know half a million dollars, right? So it's not chump change. You know, a thousand feet's a big difference. Um, so um, you know, we did uh, just did for. For example, you know, we talked about the gym. The, the MSBA says 6,000. We were really, we said it, we want it bigger than what we've got, but not 6,000. So, you know, we want to bring that down. And then there's some other spaces that's just, well, it's really multi-purpose, and can we get rid of some of, you know, some rooms there? So, um, I'm just a little, I'm a little uncomfortable with our total being a bit higher than I think we should be for square feet, mm -hmm. um, and that having implications. So. I don't know if that's what, what you were. Well, I'd like to hear people's well. thoughts and, and comments on that, um, because I would like to be able to give you a charge, and if that charge turns out to be well, let us think a little bit more and hold off a week or or some you know some amount of time, then it may be a better result. Um, but if folks have consensus that they're generally comfortable, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. So Heather, you had a hand up, and then Karina. Yeah, so two things. One about the kind of general square footage and how close we're getting. And and I know Maria, uh, rightly so, is uh, wanting to make sure we're not over-designing, providing too much space in a building. Um, but I do know that there are folks that are sort of uncomfortable with a lot of the push to multi-use of spaces when people are asking us to use those spaces in a multi-way, don't really understand the programming that's happening in those spaces very well. And um, I, I know folks are getting uncomfortable with how much this is feeling like it's getting squeezed. And I know Arani's talked 
often about wanting to make sure we have a building that is very useful and will continue to move forward in the future. And if anything makes a building <coughs> unuseful, it's just too small. You know, if the, the more we can, you know, the only evidence we have for how we're going to use a building in the future is how we're using it now. You know, we, we so getting it as close as we can to what we use now, and I think that's sort of at the higher end of what, you know, Maria is, is maybe not comfortable with, but we do know that, we do know Fort River is slightly oversized, is oversized, but people are getting pretty uncomfortable with it getting squeezed too much, and if we want to make sure it's flexible in the future, we have to make sure that we have that space for those things to happen. And in Fort River, the other thing that Fort River, we have to understand, is that it's oversized in a lot of the sort of core spaces, or the classroom spaces, but things like the toilet rooms are grossly undersized. So when we're looking at how that building gets used, the overall square footage might be a lot closer in alignment with, and that's where the MSBA guidelines come in. And so I just, I'm really uncomfortable with squeezing this any further than what we have now. Can I, can I support that in my own way, I suppose? Um, we're at 84,000 as our target overall GSM. And the MSBA would be 69,000. But, but the MSBA would not have pre-K. And it would not know about your district-wide special ed program. So if we see if the pre-K is 6,000 gross, and the district special ed when you gross them are going to be 5,000. That's 11,000 that accounts for why, why we're different from the MSBA guideline. Um, so that would bring you down to 73,000 um, against 69,000. So then you're really right in the ballpark. I mean, and whether or not you choose the bigger gym would make the difference as to whether you're following the MSBA. So that's my, my pitch as to why we're not that far off. There's um, two programs that are unpredicted in the MSBA guideline that we have in this building. So I mean, I have that here. Yeah, I'm, I found that thinking between. I think there are some rooms that I think Maria put the number now, and I thought that like, I see the music rooms that they are used for a day and a half. They are 500 square foot each, half a million dollars. Again, 1,000 square feet, two rooms, 1,000 square feet per room that is used one day and a half a week, I don't feel comfortable. It's hard to justify a room like that being used one day and a half per week. Um, I look at the space summary of the previous project that they were that the rooms were 175 square foot. So it's a big difference there. Do we need to be 500 square foot in music rooms or can they be smaller? Can we, can we use them for multi-purpose in the same way that uh, Mike was saying we need more ELA rooms? Can we say, Okay, three and a half days of the week they're committed for your life, the rest is music. Because as square footage, if you say that's one thousand square foot is about half a million dollars, then I get nervous about having something that is half a million dollars for a day and a half. We could be using that amount of money for other things. Um, so I would like to have a balance and start looking at the, because they add up. All these little things, maybe there's 400 square foot here, it's 500 there. They add up to a big difference in, in the end. Um, if you, again, I go back to why do the numbers are so different. And I know that the special education program at Fort River are very different than Whitewood, but Whitewood, if you look at the special education, is 3,700 square foot um, right now for special, for special education. And in Fort River, it's 12,400. The well, but that's not what's proposed. No, 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 that's not what is proposed. Crocker Farm has 5,000. What sure. is proposed is 8,000, about 8,000. Right. So it's a huge disparity between our schools. Um, well, and there's a huge disparity in programming. Yeah, yeah but Crocker but Farm but 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 our but program is. Yeah. So first off, on special education, mm -hmm. this is like a real flashpoint. You've had multiple meetings with the special education staff. The programming that goes on at Fort River is very different than the programming that's going on at Wildwood or at Crocker Farm. Yeah. Um, the reason why more space is, you already know this, you spend a lot of yeah. time with folks there. 
So the reason why there's more square footage allocated to special needs programming at Fort River is because what they're doing is different. It needs to be larger. Um, it's the benchmarking and against either MSBA or Wildwood isn't reasonable, but I have a broader point, which is it doesn't matter if I think it's reasonable or not. The product of this project is not going to be considered credible if we hack away at the SPED space and offer something that the very first thing at CPAC, our SPED staff, the principal and the superintendent say is this isn't realistic, this isn't what we'd be using, this isn't what we need. So it makes the deliverable not credible. And so, and that's actually gonna be a broader point I'm gonna make about, about um, getting down into the weeds on hacking space one way or another. I honestly don't think it makes a difference whether the report that we generate out of this, the deliverables in the end, whether, as long as, as, long as the programming is consistent between the different options, so the renovation option, partial demo and construction, and new construction, mm -hmm. as long as the program is consistent across those options so that the comparisons you can make about the feasibility of these different options, different costs, are apples to apples, yeah. then I don't think it makes a difference whether we, cut, whether we add or cut space a thousand square feet one way or another. I mean, because the costs that we're talking about in terms of an extra million dollars or whatever it is, is, is fictional. I mean, we're not building anything. Uh, out, of, out of this directly, and at the point, even though this is going to be very useful information for the public and for future a future building committee, when that future building committee is looking at it, if they need to cut 500 square feet or a thousand, they they will because yeah. they have to make that trade off. Right. So it doesn't really matter if we include it or not include it here, except for for one really important thing, which is at different time points in the future, this deliverable is going to be sitting with different stakeholders and public audiences. And they have to look at something and they have to see that the decisions that were made, um, and not even literally what the decision is, like is it 6,000 square feet or not for the gymnasium? Um, in a certain sense, it's arbitrary whether it's 6,000 or 5,000, except for the fact that when somebody looks at it, they're gonna say, well, how'd you make your decision anyway? And if, if the decision is, well, I hacked off 1,000 square feet because I wanted the project to look cheaper, that's not really a good reason. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm serious about this. It's not really a good reason when you're thinking about comparing different options. Um, saying, I mean, and I'm seeing this seriously, that saying that we currently program for a space that has, um, you know, 37, 45 square feet. Yes, MSBA says it's 6,000, but honestly, when we talked to Principal Chamberlain, she could, you know, larger than what's now made sense, but it didn't need to be 6,000. At least having that in the footnote somewhere that there's a that there's a like there's a credible rationale. rationale for the decision makes a lot of sense to me. But I'm just saying to me the deliverable, in my personal view, the work of this committee is to ensure that the work product that comes out of it can be viewed as being utterly transparent and credible, whether people like it or agree with it or not is irrelevant in a certain sense. But that the decisions that are made can are utterly transparent. It completely explicable and that people who look at it will say, oh, I get it. I, I, get, I get how they made that decision. I get why they made that decision. And more importantly, then, they can look across the range of options and say between option A and option G, they can say, oh, I get, I, you know, I can see, oh, I can see now why, you know, what, what the difference is between this option and, and I can learn now about the viability of different options. I mean, and, and not, more importantly, if we, if in my personal opinion, very strongly, if we divert from that mission of ensuring we have a transparent, explicable, and defensible product that a third party could look at and say, "Oh, I get how we got here, and I get what it is," and it doesn't, un it isn't unduly controversial in its elements, um, then the, if we get away from that, then I think we're in trouble because in the end, the the value of this work product is that people learn something from it. And it's viewed as being a completely, sort of a neutral document in terms of the quality of information you can learn from it. Which is why also I think it's good we added in option one for air-cooled VRF because if that's the cheap, if that's the most logical way to do a renovation option, then show that in the renovation option. So that you can, so that, so that we're not gaming it against, unduly gaming the outcome against a renovation option. You can talk about the deficiencies of it in there.
Anyways, sorry. That's a that's a that's a long thing, but I, since I missed, I list, I missed the last meeting, and also to be blunt, I I I heard too much buzzing around around what we're trying to accomplish here with this committee. Too many outside stakeholders talking about what are they really doing and what are they really getting done. And also, I've gotten banged at on the school committee around what we're actually doing here. And so part of what I'm trying to do is give you, um, part of what I'm saying is actually collective feedback from the school committee on one level. But it's also just a sense of, look, let's not get, we're, this has been good work. And this committee's done good work up until this point. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked very well. And I'm proud of what we're doing so far. Let's make sure we keep it on that level. Sorry, I really went off, and I know you have to leave, so I, I've done, I've done <laughs> evil work for the quorum of our group. I apologize. So I do need to wrap up. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to need to wrap up soon. So what, I mean, do we need to, my understanding is that we can say, go ahead and price out these options, and that, that that's, and do we need to vote on that? And I, I think it, it would probably be good because it represents a, a commitment to them that, that you know that we should move forward, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm I'm feeling a bit more comfortable that at least we have the ability to to look at this again. Sure. This mm -hmm. isn't a, a, a one time, uh, once only shot because I think there are things that are going to be discussed, and 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 I, I I understand absolutely where you're coming from, Eric, and, and but people are going to look at it, and we do need to be able to. Defend parts of it, but I think so almost all of this is defensible. It is. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I think it is defensible. I mean, I'm not saying it isn't defensible. Yeah. for months, yeah. and and, there, and and every single thing in here, even the larger gym, you know, there's a reason why it's in there. And and as I think it was a, as Eric said or Marie, I can't remember. You know, at at a certain point, we can say, well, no, we can't afford that big of a gym, so we're going to have to cut it down. But right. that's not this point. That's not where we're at right now. We're at the point of What's How possible? Cost? Yeah, yeah. And, what, and what does it cost? And I have to sheepishly admit that, you know, when I was looking at these bottom lines, I didn't really fully realize that the, the MSBA model doesn't have the pre-K in it. And what was the other thing? That, or it's not going to account for the, the nature of the, of the, of the right. special ed um, in this district. And so it, it looks like a, a larger dichotomy than it is. There's still a difference there. There's still a delta, um, but it's, it's not it's not 4, square feet. It's not 11, yeah. but yeah. Maria. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the difference for the special education program for the district-wide programs is pretty much accounted for in this. It's about 3K more, so that's not really the issue. The, a large, right, it's 4,500 4, versus 7,800. 7, well, yeah, but you have three district. You have to yeah. multiply by 1.5. Right, right, but, but, but what I'm saying is that the approximate difference there is the difference of having three district-wide programs in the building as well, right? In terms yeah. of the MSBA, MSBA I, yeah. versus what we have. Yeah. So that's pretty right. You're, we are always going to be above because of the school district's policy on class size, and that is another 6,000 yeah. or so. That's a, that's 5, a very 6, big, big piece. Right. I'm talking about around the edges, and I'm talking about there are some rooms, I mean, it, it, you can have some uh, some cumulative effect which can make the difference of a couple K square feet. That's, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking, you know, but, and it's not really even of the core academic um, issues because that's a school district policy. If you're not gonna change the school district policy on class size, and you're not gonna lose that six, but that has to be perfectly well explained. Um, as when we present this, because people are going to ask, like, why is it different from MSBA? And we're going to have to say, well, it's different because we no, have 18 rooms not, instead yeah, of 13. Right. Story. Yeah. So you had a comment, and yeah. I'm kind of then want to, if we can, just return quickly before you have to leave to the question of whether we can all support moving this to the next stage, knowing that we can have a little bit of tweak. Well, I, I guess I. What I'm hearing from Maria is maybe that you're not comfortable moving forward with this. Because I don't know if... I did not say that. Okay. That's what I, I wanted. <coughs> I just... Uh, I'm also hearing you say that you feel like some of the rooms, especially in special ed and ELL, 
I don't. Good. I okay. actually never said that at all. Okay. Can you be more specific then about which rooms you're talking Are, about? Do that, we want? I mean, we can talk I, about I, this, but um, I no, think that if, was I not think what if we I can, if, I think I'm sensing consensus to let them move forward. I think we can keep talking about pieces of it, like. The, I the had music a couple of comments about the designs, but. But, but I'd rather gra grab grab the, the quorum. And, and I think what you're trying to do was very, very wise. <laughs> get, get, your, get your voter consensus while you can. <laughs> well, yeah. I can. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I could, quorum, we can't do it. That's right. Yeah. So I, I would like I would like us to vote. Um, I don't know enough about parliamentary provisions to know that we truly need to do it, but I would like us to vote uh, to to or at least someone to offer a motion to vote to move this forward so they can take this to cost estimate. Eric. Like move uh, the committee uh, approve allowing the uh, TSKP to move forward with cost estimation of the uh, of the options as presented at the meeting of October twenty fourth, twenty eighteen. Second here, second. All in favor? So if we have time. <laughs> we have time. Can I make a couple of comments? <coughs> yes. I regarding the two level. The, the additions of the new school with two levels. My concern is um, accessibility to the second floor for people with reduced mobility. Um, I think I brought it up in the past. It's because we discussed with the special education uh, okay. group. And the preference was to have um, those programs with the academic classrooms. And, uh, the, the students in those programs are in the classroom, uh, and so they need to be proximate. They, okay. they felt like they they'd be okay on the second floor. My, my daughter's in one of those programs, so maybe I could help explain a little bit about sure. how these programs work and, and why it's necessary for them to be adjacent. I'm not saying I'm not saying that. I was thinking maybe of having some kind of, instead of one side having a stairs, have a ramp. Mm -hmm. oh. so, so, so that you can evacuate and people, it's not just special education, maybe somebody broke the leg and they cannot, mm -hmm. they well, cannot go. There, there will be an elevator. Yeah, but it's... Right. Yeah, I think it has to depend on the getting in and out from using the levee or having to move a whole classroom downstairs because somebody broke the leg and is on a chair for extended periods of time. That kind of thing. So if you have a ramp, at least in one of the sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That We've done that. Uh, yep. And then it goes back to the, the drawing. The stairs here, they don't go anywhere. That can be fixed. Oh, I see. It's a little shift in the stair. Yeah. So this one doesn't have a. Uh, inside the building, right. or inside the building. So ju just for the just for the record, we we have Thank you. lost forum. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna close our, our, yeah. our public meeting. Um, and but in closing, I will say that I think we we need to be able to come back and have another meeting where we actually get the opportunity as a group to really look through these things in detail. Um, I think we all saw probably things as you did that, that could use some tweaking. So as we write our narratives, we can report more. We had no agenda for the next meeting, so perhaps that that would be a good agenda. Yeah. There was going to be the revised schedule, right? We do have to eventually talk about our, our revised schedule because I suspect we're yeah. well. I, <laughs> I feel like we're a little behind, but maybe we're not. We can, but we can talk about that for the next. Uh, When's the next okay. meeting? Yes. You know, when is the next meeting? November seventh. That's a good question. November. 7th. And that will be at 6.15. Yeah. Okay. And while, I mean, I mean, we're kind of adjourned by default since we lost yeah. the forum. But, um, but Mr. Morris, Dr. Morris, yeah. yes, because <laughs> like, this is scheduling. Um, he had difficulty getting here for later times, but he's had a, a, a shift in his schedule mm -hmm. such that it is now actually easier for him to be here later. So really? I know I yes. <laughs> How does that happen? I don't know. Wait. I'm not going there. It's, um, it's the hurting of a cat. I'm just saying. <laughs> so <laughs> this is all to say that we did. You know, I I know I just sent around the thing that says can we alternate between five o'clock and six fifteen. So I think that might be back to just today? back to six fifteen, starting with two weeks from today, and then we get into a kerfuffle because we're near um, Thanksgiving. Yeah. So it won't be two weeks from there, but I. I think the time is going to be 6.15. It seems that that will be the case. And then we can have Dr. Morris here until at least 7.15 when he has to go elsewhere. But we can do what we need to do 
while we've got him. So, so is that okay with so at least the people in the so room? So I have yeah. a question. Just for the scheduling, we used to have 6015, 6, so Christine would make Oh, yeah, so we could be 630 six. or something. Or 6. six. Yeah. I would move it maybe to 6, so then Morris is more time. Yes, that's a meeting. great point. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, so how about 6, because I think that's officially what I. It's nice and also the first anyway, time. Anyway, I think it's possible that it's like, less. It's 617. It's yeah. 602. Nice hey, if this was Hanford College, it would be 617. All right, so but. 6 o'clock. On November seventh. Okay, that's and about then, five. We'll follow this up with an and, email. <laughs> and then uh, I guess we're just going to have to figure what do we do um, with the odd week because of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. You got these? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Did you already get them? Did I give you mine?